Scano, good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see everyone today at uh, 12 lunchtime. We'll see if I know some people are joining in. They're like, this it seems to be working for my, my lunchtime and my little breaks. But just so everyone knows, you can also go in and rewatch it on our Facebook um on Grandmother's Voice, and I believe on um, Facebook for McQuestion Urban Farms. And then if uh, Halton Environment Network and Sustainable Milton tag it, you can watch it there too. So, um, and also our YouTube channel, but uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's so great to see to see you here again. I'm, I'm excited to talk about, you know, what we sow and early planting for our early crops or, you know, whatever it is that we want to, you know, to start planting. Cause we're excited. We're getting to learn more about, you know, I, for me, I think I mentioned it last time, confidence, you know, and why we're coming together and learning, but, you know, let's just go in and say hello to everyone that's in this, this little square box. <laughs> Good afternoon. Who wants to go first? I will, I will jump in. Uh, so my name is Andrea Rowe. I am the Director of Sustainable Environments at Halton Environmental Network, which means I just love to talk to people about gardening and growing and how do we create a healthy environment for us and for the future generations? How can we take better care of the land? I can go next. Uh, I am Kevin Hamilton and I employed by Nawasa, and I'm here at McQuestion Urban Farm uh, down in the east end of Hamilton, and I too have a passion for growing food and sharing knowledge and being healthy and encouraging others to be healthy um, and all those good things and be outside and enjoy the rewards of getting your hands in the earth and being connected and, uh, and feeding yourself. Thanks, everyone. So my name is Wendy Roberts, and I'm with a group in Milton called Sustainable Milton. Um, gardening is one of our um, the things that we are, are loving to do. I'd say of the group here, I'm probably one of the newer ones to uh, to gardening. But we have um, we have some a native seed garden, a pollinator garden, and a just fairly new community garden at the Italian Cultural Center of Milton that we're trying to um, establish. And uh, our goal really is to make where we live more sustainable and uh, happy to be part of this. Thank you very much. Awesome. It's great to see all of you again. Um, I think it's, you know, I'm with Grandmother's Voice. I'm one of the co-founders and, you know, be just just before COVID, actually, uh, so a couple of years ago, the grandmas, you know, made a really strong message to us and said, we need to connect with people. You know, how, how can we do that in a way to keep us connected and and really moving forward and building our relationships? And then and then COVID happened. So we had already begun to, you know, do do a form of lives and reaching out and having conversations to connect with people abroad. And then and then we came, you know, through COVID had the opportunity to create to create community in Milton and have a, a space and a healing garden. And through that time uh, and it was really quick that I was introduced to um, Kevin and Amy over at McQuestion Urban Farm in Hamilton. And I went there just, I had heard about them and what they were doing was amazing, amazing from what I heard. And when I showed up, I was like, what is, this is, this is amazing. And how do we not know about it? And what I, what I think is um, even more beautiful and amazing is that now um, you had mentioned Kevin, that you're part of uh, a part of, Nuasa, right? And their Nuasa and they're an indigenous organization. So, you know, again, I'm just gonna I'm gonna say like what the elders and, and grandmothers say is that you know our, our ancestors are you know having a lot of fun with us by connecting us and in creating these opportunities that you know are inviting indigenous and non-indigenous people to come together as relatives and community and to continue to share knowledge and, and just create a better uh, world and earth for our coming faces and, and everyone in it today. So, so this is great. I, I love this collaborative. We, you know, have a, a mix of knowledge and every once in a while we get some great content from the people who send comments in and questions. So, you know, we encourage you to continue to send them into the chats 
uh, and we uh, let's talk about you know our our topic, which is you know how do how do we start to now um, you know plant and what do we want to plant and you know do we have to be so strategic about this because I know I get caught up in like planning and lists and then I'm just like okay forget it let's just do it so how do we just do it. Has, that, has anybody put anything in the field yet, Andrea or Wendy? Yeah, we did. We did. We did garlic up at the at the center, right in Milton. We did the garlic up at the center. I just actually um, am at my my trailer in in uh, outside of Windsor, and all of my sweet grass because Windsor is is warmer, right, than the area that I'm in in Milton. My sweet grass, my my sage is all coming up, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, where can I plant this and make it come up everywhere? So. What have you been doing, Kevin? You're the one with the big farm up there. We are uh, very busy. We're potting a lot of things up right now from smaller pots to bigger pots, so they're not getting root bound. Um, but as far as we haven't put anything in the field yet, uh, I've been poised and ready uh, now that there's not, I think we just had a negative six or negative seven uh, last week. Um, so those are the things I look at. I look for that long range forecast, those 14 days, and it looks like we're going to be relatively frost free. I don't like to use the F word too much, uh, but yes, um, that's kind of where I'm at. But having said that, we will put out things that are frost hardy and frost tolerant, um, which essentially is a lot of your greens um, minus, I would say, basil or basil, whatever you want to call it. But uh, you can start, we transplant as much as we can to give our seedlings a little bit of a head start. Um, and then that way we're ahead of the weeds and we can plant into a nice clean bed. And we're using um, tarps to cover the beds to keep the weeds down. Or in our case, we did it over winter. So when we pull it up, the worms, the bugs, everything are right at the surface. The ground looks great and it's ready to receive our plants. So things that we do, uh, I've been a big fan of transplanting beets. Uh, I do it really early in the spring. That way I can get to market more uh, quicker and uh, I have food for ourselves. And I, I will also, sounds weird, but uh, you can transplant radish as well. And I'll do multiple seeds, same with the beets. Um, so three or four will come up in one cell. And then I'll just plant those. You shouldn't have them that close, but I plant them four to six inches uh, apart. And so that way in the spring, the beets will just grow, they'll size up on each other and grow off of each other out from the sides. And then you just pick them, the biggest ones as you need them. But I'll do the same thing with um, radishes. I'll do the same thing with turnips, if you're a turnip aficionado. Um, and then you can transplant chard, you can transplant arugula, uh, spinach, mustard greens, pak choy, pretty much all the Asian greens. Um, and then we have like, because we're doing lots of seedlings, um, other cold hardy things that you can transplant out would be um, cabbages, like the Napa cabbage or your red or your green cabbage. Um, kale will do great, lettuce, salad mix, um, onions and leeks will generally take a decent frost too if you wanted to get them really early uh, or your head lettuces, that kind of stuff. So those are all things that we have uh, have at the ready in our poise to put in the ground this week um, depending on rain and sloppiness because we've been a bit sloppy. Um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at for our greens. Wendy and Andrea, have you guys put on anything? Well, yeah, uh, I have. I haven't yet, um, but we are definitely starting tomorrow <laughs> at one of our community gardens. And we, because we're dealing with raised beds and community engagement as a strategy, um, we've started the stuff that needs to be started ahead of time. So the tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. The rest of it, we try and direct sow. Uh, for practical reasons, because we don't have enough space here in the office for any more seedlings. We're already doing rotations and have timers and everything. Um, and then the rest, we just want to start in the ground as early as possible 
with the community. So we'll, we would rather go back more often and more, more conversations happen. You get to know people a little bit better and just keep going back. And if a, a frost hits, we're planting in smaller quantities. So we'll just go back and do it again. Different strategy. Makes sense. Yeah, not all of us have uh, greenhouses and warm spaces to keep things going. Right? Yes, yes. Keep so I, uh, I got a little excited with my tomato plants and ran out of space fairly quickly. So put some in, um, I have a garden box outside on the deck. And they, they weren't doing too badly. I had them covered up. Um, but then my chickens discovered that box and decided that would become their new dirt bag. So I have about three survivors of the plants. The chickens all made it. Um, and I had also sown some cilantro seeds and some dill seeds. Um, I don't know yet if they've made it. So, but I, I've got things ready to go into the garden. So I've got the onions and the leeks, tons of tomatoes. Um, and I know that um, Andrea sent me this great list of things. So my peppers are ready. I've got some cucumbers coming up and some, yeah, some herbs. So getting very excited actually. Nice. Yeah, the other, the other thing people can do, if, you're, uh, if you have southern exposure uh, and you're getting a good amount of sun, a lot of time people just lean uh, old plate glasses or a glass up. And then, um, yeah, if you, if you can lock it off at the end, sometimes if it's getting cold, you could stick a little heater at the end and uh, heat that. But that's a great way to, if you don't have greenhouse space in that, um, it's just a natural way. Uh, a lot of the time, the thermal mass, when the ground is heated in those little spaces, they will hold the ground and keep it a uh, temperature. Yeah. Like a cold fire. frame. Cold frame. Yeah. 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 I know we replaced some windows in our house a few years ago, and I, I tried to convince my husband to keep those old windows to make me a cold frame. He's like, no, it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> He tolerates a lot of stuff, and he did buy me grow lights. For some reason, he drew the line at the cold frame. Out of our old windows, that is. So I'm still working on it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really easy. Like, I know you said you got carried away there, Wendy. It's really easy to get carried away and try to get too many things in <laughs> space. Or when you're potting up like we are, because I will sow seeds in trays, and I'll do, like, um, Say, say if, the, if the plug is this big, I'll sow like 10 tomatoes in each plug and then they all come up just so they're germinated because that saves me space. But then I got to pluck them all out and pot them up into bigger pots. And we're probably pushing 30,000 seedlings and we are completely and fully out of space. But because the weather changed now, I threw all the cold stuff outside and I just have... Um, row uh agricultural fabric which is called reme or row covers and it's a white blanket lets in 80 percent of the light keeps the moisture in and it's also like a protective barrier from pests mm -hmm. and bunnies i mean this is in the spring it's really challenging when you do put stuff out you have to think about that because uh bunnies will wipe you out mm -hmm. I have a bit of a funny story uh, just when you were talking about sowing 10 tomato seeds in your in your small pot. We had started some pepper seeds or tried to start some pepper seeds from some that I saved from a few years ago. So I wasn't sure how viable they were. And we had very limited success. So my co-op student, my high school co-op student, found a packet of... Um, commercially saved seeds and she was like how many should i start i'm like i i don't know like we're behind schedule at this point let's just start the whole package so she put them on a plate with the paper towel moistened put it in a ziploc bag and i swear they all germinated so uh, she has been potting up an excessive amounts and so on her co-op report uh, that she has to submit every week she was like so many pepper seeds <laughs> So sometimes, yes, exuberance can uh, come back to, to haunt you a little bit. <laughs> yes. no, we're actually still uh, seeding into plugs. If anybody's interested in still doing that, um, 
there's a lot of things you can transplant. Uh, but we just this morning I was doing our uh, our zucchinis, our cucumbers, our squash, our melons, our watermelons. So I did that in the um, we have um, what do you call it uh, disposable compostable cups, and that's what we were doing them in for our seedling sale and. Last year, I made the mistake of doing it about three and a half weeks, four weeks before. And because these <clears throat> cucumber, squash, melons, those kinds of things, watermelons, they grow really fast. They were unruly and a real pain in the butt to separate. Like even when they're in their own little things, they were just growing into each other. Mm -hmm. um, so this year, I did it a lot later. So I think two weeks is good where you'll have the first true leaf. The cotyledons are those two, like they're kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, that shape and then you get your true leaf which is the leaf um and at that stage those are great so that's things that we're still seeding um and we're now direct seeding something so peas you can get in as early as the ground is workable uh because they do take a good frost too um and with the changing weather and things getting really hot really quickly like something like rapini um which is like a 30-day italian a bitter herb in embrace your bitters people if you can embrace <laughs> bitter herbs like i don't know arugula i don't think is bitter but some people call it bitter but the rapinis and dandelion and that that is your cleansing herbs that will clean out your liver and get all the toxins if you enjoy a glass of wine or beer after a hard day's work like i do those are good things to help keep you going um and with the changing of the weather things get really hot really quick so things like rapini it just goes to flower right away and peas might not you might not get a really great harvest so it's important to get them in early when the temperatures are cool and then again you can try in the fall for those uh for things that are quick greens like that um carrots and parsnips are the other ones that we're getting in the ground now. um carrots will take 42 days to germinate at zero to two degrees Celsius to give you an idea. So it's also important when you put these seeds in, don't give up on them. I have rosemary that we put in early March. That is just, I can't even believe, I'm still watering it. And they're this big, like the two cotyledons, the first two leaves came up and I couldn't believe that they were still coming. So one of those things like, you don't want to waste space, but carrots take a long time to germinate sometimes, and you can just you can get them in early, but you just got to keep watering. And I actually use a blowtorch, um, and that is the industry standard, but I have like a backpack, a uh, mini propane tank, and a big wand, and I will sow a few radish seeds in my line of carrots, and the radish seeds come up really quick, and then that way I know where my row is. Um, if there's, if it's not obvious, like some when I walk up the cedar, there's an obvious indentation and I know they're every 18 inches is what we do our bed, uh, our rows. Um, but when, if you do a few radish seeds, you can see where it is. And then I take this blowtorch and I blowtorch all along that row when I see the weeds coming up. And then if you put a little bit of a, like a piece of wood or something to cover your seed track at the beginning of the row, usually it will come up underneath that wood. Things will germinate a day or two ahead of the carrots. And so usually on day four, day three, day four, I will run the blowtorch along and it'll kill all the weeds. And then you'll get these carrots that come up or the parsnips because they're long germinating. They take a long time to come up and parsnips and carrots are an absolute pain in the butt to weed. You really got to get down there and, do, 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 and it's a real time consumer. Um, so that's what they do in the industry is these big arms come out on the sides of the tractors and they blow towards the entire field um, until the carrots come up. But it's a really, it's, it's kind of a cheat and I won't ever do it any other way because if anybody's grown carrots, you know how meticulous uh, a crop that is. Hmm. <laughs> I've never heard of using a blowtorch in that uh, manner, but I guess it makes sense. You got to do on a larger scale what you got to do. But I have heard of using a piece of wood after you sow your carrot seeds, put a, a plank of wood down, um, preferably something that's not leaching chemicals. So you don't want to use plywood if it's not, uh, if it's a fresh piece, use cedar or something that's not going to leach. 
but the wood helps to trap more heat in the soil as well. So your carrots will germinate faster. And after about 10 days, just take the wood off. Yeah, that's what we do. Them. Like a daily kind of thing after, yeah, whatever, day five, day seven. I've had carrots germinate on day three, which is almost unheard of, but it was just warm and we got rain like three days mm -hmm. Me just enough with sunny breaks in between it was a yeah years yeah. the dream year <laughs> i just have a nice go ahead jody <laughs> oh no sorry i'm not, i'm like you know i'm, I'm taking notes actually <laughs> because i'm you know i want to i really you know i have a little bit of space here in my in my garden where i'm at and it's and it's not even actually garden in the ground. It's actually a, a big planter that my friend made for me. And you know, I'm just trying to remember back when we were talking about companion planting. And so, you know, I don't think that it, you know, uh, repeating is ever wrong. Okay, for especially for someone like me that's a beginner. And so I'm thinking like everything you're saying, Kevin, makes sense. Like a rapini and the dandelion. I love those anyway. Like that's a big part of my diet. Um, so I like, is there any companion planting at this time of year that you know is like a you know, is it is a go-to, right? You know that if you're planting this, then you should have that, or in general, is there something? that we should be thinking about um, including if we're planting our greens or anything, any vegetables or, you know, I don't know. Because I can't remember what we said back then, to be honest with you. <laughs> I mean, we, I'm not sure if marigolds take a frost. Does anybody know about that? Because we're planting a lot of marigolds this year, just interspersing them. I would say that they probably do because I have had marigold seeds self-sow in my raised garden bed. So I would say they're not too delicate. Right. It's worth, in, it's worth investigating and doing some some research, but. Yeah, that, that is a good one. I know that it deters uh, a lot. So we're just going to plant them every like 15 feet kind of in in our beds and then um if they get unruly you can always just cut them back or it's one of those things we'll keep sewing um okay yeah. cool. okay so just doing a quick a quick internet search no not frost tolerant cannot tolerate cold temperatures so i guess once they start to grow they're a little more sensitive yeah and i mean with what we're doing here um you can probably find that agricultural row cover I mean, the downside is it's a it's a petrochemical fabric, and it is kind of delicate. You might get four years, five years. In a backyard gardener, you could probably get more. Um, but yeah, that is the the one answer. You can either just cover it right over, um, and I just take a shovel and dig it in so it stays down. Um, and or if you have anything that can be act like a hoop to keep it off of the plant is another great way and it's a physical barrier that doesn't answer the companion planting question there but it's another way to keep um <laughs> pests off especially all those brassicas like the rapinis and broccoli and the cauliflower and all those things um which again is why i like to transplant as much as i can because then the plant is already bigger and stronger and can take a bit of a uh, mm -hmm. pest i think to answer jody's question figure out what do you want to grow and then figure out what the companions are for that plant. Okay. Yeah. As opposed to saying, I want some companion plants because they all have different friends and needs and superpowers. Yeah. Like, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, so I was looking earlier in terms of um, some of the plants and mostly herbs that also help repel or attract uh, good and bad bugs. Um, so I was taking a look at, you know, I understand dill and chives, but also onions, um, mm -hmm. so some of that pungent stuff, um, and things that will repel the uh, tomato worm. Um, so I, what I saw is dill and chives, basil, and of course, borage was my newly found thing last year, but it self-seeds like crazy. Um, but it's a, a friend of mine calls it a bee magnet. And another friend has just planted crazy amounts of borage. And then you can turn it over because it's very nitrogen rich, right? Mm -hmm. So they actually talk about it as um, a green manure and a cover crop. So have you had much experience with any of that stuff? But especially the borage, it grows crazy. 
Yeah, we do have borage, and it uh, definitely brings in different pollinators and stuff, but I haven't used it as a repellent. I've done carrots um, and onions together. Uh -huh. So I'll do a row of onions, uh, a row of carrots, and then a row of onions because that's the carrot rust fly, and sometimes you get that little rusty kind of the carrots are bitten on the top. That's a carrot rust fly. Um, so yeah, yeah, onions is definitely a good one. And then if you if you're having a foresight and you put your garlic in in before the full moon in October, that's when we plant garlic. Uh, to get the biggest bulbs, you can still do it in the spring. You just get smaller bulbs. But uh, yeah, if you can leave space and then you can do carrots and stuff in between because, yeah, strategize that way. Hmm. But yeah, borage, that's a good one. And then, yeah, I mean, being able to turn that in and treat it as a green manure is also a beneficial thing. That's what I think I'm going to do with the marigolds if they get a little unruly on us. Or keeping a little composter at the end of rows or beds so you can just pull them out and then chop it up and compost it. Um, Actually, I was thinking about that too. I was like, what do you do with all of your, like the weeds and, you know, where do they go? Like, do, what, do you, what do you do with that when you're pulling weeds and cleaning up your garden? Is there a process or something or does that really just go into the... The brown bags and then you send them off at the end of the you know the driveway what, what do you guys do andrea and wendy again we because we're in so many different community gardens um if they're munis municipal owned they've got a, a central composting um area but for the most part we just brown bag them, bring them home. And then at least I know that all of those weed seeds are getting heat um, high enough to kill the weed seeds. So uh, I brown bag them. There's only one or two gardens where we do on-site composting. Hmm. Yeah, and we've actually, we've just um, moved the composters at the Italian Cultural Center closer towards the, uh, the community beds. Um, and we're actually having somebody come in to do a compost 101, and he's going to build a composter as he's doing the lesson. So it's June 12th. Stay tuned for more <laughs> details. Um, so at this point in time, we've put them in the composter as well. But I guess my, my concern is, does it get enough heat you know, to kill all the weed stuff? Because we don't want to just be composting so we can produce more weeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we, well, I'll surface compost. I'll just pull the weeds and leave them there, especially if it's a sunny day. If I know there's rain, then I might throw them in the path. And then at least we can trounce them and kill them again. Um, we can take them to the compost too. Another thing that I do, and this is where uh, our own ingenuity and our own powers of observation come in, but I will take weeds, uh, especially because I know my, um, my bioindicators of different populations of weeds and what they tell you um, as far as nutrition in the soil and fertility and that, because uh, compaction will give you more thistles and stuff like that. And high fertility is like chickweed and um, lamb's quarters and pigweeds. Um, and they won't go to seed at this stage, but if they go to seed when they're like three feet, four feet tall, then you know you've got good fertility and usually you shouldn't let your weeds go. But anyways, long story short, I'll take these weeds, macerate them, like beat them with a, a rock or something to get the juice and stuff out of it. And then you can put it in water and stir that for a day. Or if you really want to aerate it and put a little couple of hoses in there and bubble it, then you can all this nutrient will come out of that that has been taken from your bed and then you can use it as a fertilizer and water your your crop the observational part is what it does because there might be weeds that you don't know and they might have a negative effect but that's where you can just do say first five plants in your bed or whatever and then observe um i have not killed anything over the long term doing that kind of thing and I have noticed that things will grow faster and are darker green. So that's another kind of strategy for mm -hmm. dealing with weeds. And then you don't have to worry about the, the weed seed and stuff too, because um, you've soaked it and beaten it up and whatever and put it in water. And then you can just throw that on the lawn or whatever. 
I've always wanted to try that with comfrey. Ah, uh, yes, a dynamic accumulator. It's a really great one. Yeah, and if you can grow comfrey around in all your shady places, um, do it. Um, I'm trying to populate in and around our in our forest and that, and just put it everywhere because it's such a great one. Stinging nettle is the other dynamic accumulator, meaning it takes whatever minerals and stuff is available in the soil, fixes it into the plant. So when you beat that up and put it in your compost or put it in a compost tea, um, you get a lot of nutrient benefit out of that. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with those two plants, I'm going to put them in the chat just so you can do some research. So come free, F-R-E-Y, and there we go. And stinging nettle is the other one. Thank you, Jody. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I, I won't name the, the winery, but one of the biodynamic wineries, um, which I quite enjoy, uh, they use the stinging nettle to spray their grapes to keep uh, pests away. So um, I don't have a big enough <laughs> garden to really make it worth my while, but I guess it's something that we could consider at Grandmother's Voice. If we're going to do one of the two, let's do comfrey and not the stinging nettle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've been poked too many times by them. <laughs> Although I do love watching the uh, the wild survivor shows and Bear Grylls has a really good demonstration on how to fold all of those stinging thorns into the inside and then chew it <laughs> so you can eat it without getting your mouth torn apart. If you <laughs> no, have, thank you. No, thank you. When it's young, yeah. I mean, this is a true story. I had a friend in her 30s. Her hair started going gray at the roots and... Uh, and then I asked her uh, a couple of years later, she was an intern on our farm, and I asked her, can I ask you something personal? Your hair used to be gray. Are you coloring? Or like, and she's like, no, I started drinking a, a liter of nettle tea every day. And by remineralizing her body, her hair went back to normal color. So oh. um, I could use some. Uh, <laughs> some hair? <laughs> for me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's just the power of, of minerals. And getting those minerals into your crops is going to make you healthier because it's going to get into your, in, uh, yeah. your. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. I've heard of that too. All right. So to circle back to today's topic, top three things that we can sow outdoors right now that you're excited about. You I, asking me? No. Nope. Uh -oh. <laughs> tossing it out there. Okay, Wendy, go. I'm, I'm making a list, but I'm gonna I'm gonna add to my list. So go ahead, Kevin. Tell us. Pepper. I, what's that? Peppers. Can we do that? Peppers. Direct sow outside right now. Oh no, I've got them little plants. Okay, direct sow. Take your seed, put it in the garden. What are you excited to do? Oh. Hmm. Okay, I'll go first. Okay, you go. Yes, snap please. Peas. Love snap oh, peas man. for breakfast in the morning when I do my early morning walk. So snap peas, carrots, and beets. Because I love sense. beets, but I love beet greens as well. So those are my top three. Mm. Amazing. Uh -oh. Add to that, Kevin. I, I love rapini. I love embracing those bitter greens. They're so yummy. So yeah, uh, spinach is another one. I have a hard time with it, but it loves the cool temperatures. So that's a... Another great one. And then a beautiful thing is salad mix. Uh, if you have lots of salad seeds because you sow the salad mix and you can get up to five cuts on it. So a cut comes up, you cut it, take it inside, wash it just above the growth node, and then you can get another three to five cuts. By the fifth cut, it starts to get more bitter as uh, it grows back. But yeah, yep. that's another great one because it gives multiple. Cut and, yep. cut and come again, salad yep. greens. Yep. Amazing. I haven't tried okra yet, but I think I will. Okra and then yep. uh, the arugula and Swiss chard. What about those nice. three? Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Okay. I'll try that. I'm doing all of them. <laughs> I am going to go do, I'm going to get all of those seeds and no. that's what I'm planting. No, I will what? bring some for you on Saturday. You send me your list. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Well, my list is what you guys all just said. It's because I eat it all and, and I love it. I think it's fabulous. So why not? Why can't I just that be my garden this year? Why am I going to, you know, try to do something that, you know, 
add to my all the work I'm doing. Yep. That's perfect. And I can throw a couple of marigolds in there, you're saying? Yeah. Maybe on sure. the ends, right? Uh, maybe I don't know. protect them with a piece of cloth or something if there's going to be frost. Yeah. Um, okay. The other thing for beginners, uh, kale and Swiss chard. Swiss chard is the highest yielding vegetable per square foot along with leeks and along with rutabagas. Wow. It's, it's a leafy green, but I've seen Swiss chard leaves in high fertility the size of my torso. Like it looked like a Jurassic period, like something of dinosaur would come and So we can be Cleopatra with our chard leaves, <laughs> fanning <laughs> ourselves. You have the right partner. Mm -hmm. you Fanned or children. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I love Swiss chart too, actually. So, yeah. yeah it I just, was just going to yeah. say, I would love to see some comments from the people that are listening that, you know, what are they excited to plant? <laughs> yeah. Well, they're saying they love this subject, which is hey, Rhonda. Yeah. And uh, love gardens. And so, you know, I, I think that um, I love how he just turned, you know, circled back to really what our conversation was about let's give some people some action so you know what can you sow right now what you can what can you plant from the seed right in the ground and i love it so yes um i'm i'm actually going to put all of those together and i'm going to do it and i'm just going to see what happens and and you know this is what this is all about We're so no more comments right now yes yes um, and I do, I love, I love the whole ideas of snap peas and, you know, it's other people's ideas that really put us, I think, you know, put us into action. Sometimes we have this desire to make a change, you know, and, but I think we get stuck in that, like, but what do we do next? And then, and then, you know, we're reading and we're reading and we're doing, and, you know, it's time to move into actually doing it. So I appreciate this, this collective and this little circle that we get together once a week and continue to invite people to join us. And next week, um, I think we're going to have a special guest next week. Leslie, who is a friend of um, our community here in, in uh, oh, Swiss chart is high on Nancy's list. Thank you for putting that in there, Nancy. <laughs> we feel heard. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so next week we're going to have some conversations about bio, bio, di, biodiversity, right? Is that what it is? I don't know why I couldn't spit that out. And uh, we'll have a new guest that you know, we can uh, meet next week again, Wendy's friend, and she'll be able to share with us and introduce us to her and have this conversation. What What is biodiversity and what does it mean? And why is it important to this conversation and, and our life, right? Mm -hmm. So um, does anyone else like to add anything here before we step away and, and just, you know, go live our life and start planning our, our little, you know, mm -hmm. spring garden? Our little piece of paradise. I have yes. a shameless self-promotion. Um, uh, the 13th of May, I believe, is a Saturday. There is a seedling sale for people that have ordered seedlings with us. We'll have a sale, too. And then on the 14th at Humble Bee, which is on Barton Street in Hamilton. Humble Bee, they're a local bee company. Uh, they have a seedling sale that we'll be at as well. So if you need seedlings, we have pretty much A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. That's and that's our, uh, your plant sale is May 28th in Burlington at Open Doors at St. Christopher's Anglican Church on Guelph Line. So stay tuned for what we'll have available at that point as well. And the Milton Horticultural Society has their plant sale the 14th and 15th at the Italian Cultural Center of Milton. Amazing. Wow. So amazing. And we have, with Grandmother's Voice, we always have things happening, too. We have our full moon ceremony happening this month. Um, the And you can see all of this on our Facebook. We have, um, actually, on Thursday, uh, May 12th, we have a placenta teaching with our collective, our, our you know, mama's group and, and doula, like just an amazing circle of women that, um, that have started this. And so many people just want these teachings and understandings and then we have a big event uh with dennis windigo our indigenous uh healer we call we all, we're all healers of ourselves. but this is a really great way to bring community together to learn more and so we're um we're happy to see everyone here but come and see us in these different spaces and visit their social media so that you can see exactly where they'll be sharing 
sharing what they have sown over over the years. So Nyawa for for being here and continue to stay connected on our social medias and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.